Welcome to session two of this online course taking you through George Spencer Brown's Laws of Form. In session one, we looked at the basics. In this session, we'll be looking at three things. Firstly, we'll be looking at a brief recap and introducing marks. In the second section, we'll be going about and playing in the sandbox, finding out how it works. And thirdly, we're going to look at some of the detail behind the concepts we've been playing with. So, let's start. We're going to recap on the basics, very briefly. We looked at the ideas of distinction and indication. All the page numbers you'll see on the screen refer to the 2011 edition of Laws of Form, and I strongly recommend you get your own copy of the book and read through it as you go through the course. The book pays off through repeated reading, and you know when you've got it, when it becomes the gift that keeps on giving. Then you can start applying it to your own field of interest and just benefit from the ways of thinking it opens up. And it all starts like this. In a plane space, a circle draws a distinction. It's so simple. This allows one side of the distinction to be indicated or marked, and that can be the inside or it can be the outside. It doesn't really matter. Call the form of the first distinction the form. This is an injunction. Spencer Brown writes in a style which has been termed E prime, that is, a style of writing which does not use the verb to be at all. That's not strictly true, but he does write in injunctions. Just like a recipe book is written, it's a series of instructions that allow you to recreate a dish. The same holds for a musical score where a series of notes on a page allows you to recreate the performance of a piece of music. And that music lives not in the notes on the page, but in the space between, in the performance and interpretation of those notes. This is very similar. Let there be a form distinct from the form. Let the mark of distinction be copied out of the form into such another form. Call any such copy of the mark a token of the mark. So here we're introducing the term token. It's more convenient to indicate the inside of the distinction as being marked, which is why when we want to say that we're pointing at the inside of the distinction, it's easier to use the symbolic form Spencer Brown comes up with, and that is called a mark. It is a horizontal line from left to right that then goes down for an equal distance on the right-hand side. It's sometimes called a cross because it invokes the act of crossing. He uses both terms in the work. If you want to indicate the outside of the distinction, the unmarked state, you use cross over cross, mark over mark. Now, you have all you need to play in the sandbox. Let's begin. You remember that two marks side by side can condense to one. And mark over mark can be cancelled because it's equivalent to the space in which it is contained. So what's the value of this arrangement? I like to work systematically. I like to work from left to right and from bottom to top. So the first thing I see are two marks side by side. I'm going to condense them. And that leaves mark over mark, which can get cancelled. Then there's another act of condensation, and that leaves an expression which has a marked value. What about this expression? Well, again, let's start from the left and go from bottom to top. We have an act of condensation. And then I can't do anything with those two marks, but whichever I choose, whether I choose the bottom two or the top two, there's going to be an act of cancellation, leaving a single mark. Then I cancel out two groups and another group and leave the single mark on its own. The value of the expression we started with is marked. 
What about this expression? We start from the left and cancel out one mark, uh, sorry, one pair of nested marks, another pair, and another. Then we have two marks side by side, which condense, and that repeats. There's two cancellations and another two. So the value of that expression is unmarked. It's pretty simple, really, isn't it? Now, let's look at some of the definitions of the terms he uses, which allow that to happen. Let's look at depth. You've got an arrangement A, and that's standing in space S, just like a circle was suspended in some kind of space. Call the space reached by the greatest number of inwards crossings the deepest space. So we've crossed one level, now we're going to go another level, and we've reached the deepest space. The outermost space, where you don't have to cross anything, is called the shallowest space. But what about the space in the middle? He refers to this as pervasive space. What does pervasive mean? To pervade, as defined in the Oxford English Dictionary, which Spencer Brown was very fond of, he had a copy of the complete full work in his library and referred to it very frequently, in that... Pervade is, defi is defined as something that spreads through and is perceived in every part of a surrounding space, or expression in this case. It is present and apparent, and that comes from the Latin pervadere, which means to travel or go throughout something. So pervasive space is the space that pervades any arrangement which has a shallowest space right down to the deepest space. It pervades it. Now suppose any space zero is surrounded by an unwritten cross. Call the crosses standing un en under any cross C written or unwritten, the cross is pervaded by the shallowest space in C. That means space SS is both outside and inside the unwritten cross. It's everywhere. And then the pervasive space is everywhere. Now, we've looked at how marks condense and how marks cancel. But we haven't looked at the implications of that going the other way. So, in the um, arithmetic, which we're going on to in next session, we'll see that mark-mark is equivalent to mark. But when you condense, you can also go the other way. So we've done condensation. We've gone from mark-mark to mark. But what we can also do is an act of confirmation, where a mark can expand to become two or more. And we've done cancellation, but we can also do compensation, where any blank space can have mark over mark put in it because that is equivalent to the blank space. As for the law of crossing, I'm going to add something that was helpful to me to realise where Spencer Brown says the value of a crossing made again is not the value of the crossing, I found it helpful to remember that only a marked state can be unmarked, and only an unmarked state can be marked. So, that's all for this session. The next session takes us deeper into the theorems behind the primary arithmetic that Spencer Brown develops from these initials which we'll recap on at the beginning of the session very briefly. Thank you for watching.